Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am delighted to have with me today, Angela Cusack. Angela, welcome to my show. Oh, goodness. Thank you for having me, Meredith. Well, I just love Angela. Angela and I met on LinkedIn and have become just great friends and colleagues ever since then. She's a very special person, and I'm just delighted to have you here. Before we get into the questions, let me give my audience a little bit of information so they'll appreciate who you are. Angela is the founder of Igniting Success and she's often called a company secret <laughs> weapon because she works with C-suite executives and what she does is so transformational that it impacts the entire organization. So that's one area of focus. The other, for my listeners who are coaches, uh, she is a master certified coach and she actually provides mentoring in the area of coaching and supervision for coaches. And she's done this over the past 15 years, both for the professional coaching certification as well as the master certified coach. So she knows the world of coaching inside and out. And she also does very extensive consulting. And what we're going to be talking about today is a topic that she's recently had an article um, published about in Choice Magazine for Coaches. So you can check that out if, uh, if you don't subscribe to that magazine. It's a wonderful resource for coaches. And congratulations on your article, Angela. Thank you so much. It's very exciting. Well, before we jump into the topic that we're going to cover today, I would love for you to give us just a little overview of what your journey has been like professionally that's brought you to where you are today. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, you know, it started off on a small country farm, uh, a very small girl with a big vision uh, for what might be possible. And so it was really that level of imagination and a bit of ingenuity that allowed me to kind of step outside and begin to really notice the things that weren't quite as obvious to other people. And it was really that gift of kind of seeing what was behind or the space between that allowed me the gift to tap into the essence of what we're going to talk about today. That led me, though, through college and um, into the financial industry for 25 years, where I served in a senior vice president corporate capacity, and left there in about 2010, give or take, and started my own company, as you already mentioned. And really, the focus of that was about igniting human potential, about really bringing forward what was truly possible and marrying the aspects of a financial acumen and business acumen together along with the people side of the house, right? So marrying those two things and helping CEOs and executives really uh, learn how to tap into that in a way that it created higher levels of engagement, higher levels of support and performance, and certainly that feeling of satisfaction and joy that we're all searching for. Mm-hmm. And you're so good at that. Uh, Angela, you just have this presence that's very calming. Mm -hmm. And um, and people feel, I think, safe and comfortable in talking to you and confiding in you. And I can really see from having gotten to know you how what a gift you are to the clients oh, who you. get to work with you. So thank you for that. Yes. And what I wanted to focus on today is the focus of this article, which mm -hmm. is a phrase called cultural humility. And mm -hmm. that term is probably new for a lot of people. So let's break it apart. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so cultural humility is actually a concept that um, Murray Garcia and Travelon actually coined back in 1998. And they were two physicians that came together to really do some interesting work psychologically with physicians um, in order to break down stereotypes, frames of references, historical discourses that kept 
physicians in particular and those in the healthcare industry um, kind of stuck in saying, saying out loud and to themselves, well, if they're of this kind of um, demographic, they must have this as an illness. If they're from this kind of uh, race, then they must have this kind of illness. So the propensity to be drawn to the left or the right was something that both of them said, you know, there's gotta be more to this. How do we begin to understand the historical discourse of who somebody else is, but at the same time treat them as individuals in the world? Mm. And so in my work, um, this notion of humility in particular began to raise up eight, nine years ago as I was doing work with coaches. Um, and as I was doing mentor coaching with them, I discovered that if I posed to them the question that helped them reveal, as I like to say, what was in your backpack? What are you carrying with you? What is your story, your narrative? Allowed them to have a different experience of themselves and allowed them to have a different experience of the person that they were coaching in order to elevate their level of skill technically from an ICF perspective. I then began to play with that as I worked with Peters and began to notice that there was an even deeper embodiment and appreciation and gratitude that would happen between a CEO and their executive team, a level of humility, if you will, that started to really um, pull forward. Well, let's, let's kind of unpack that uh, because different folks listening probably have different ideas of what we mean by humility because sometimes mm -hmm. being humble is perceived as not having confidence or you know not asserting oneself not not really being strong but in mm -hmm. reality i think for me anyway you let, let's discuss this a little bit but when somebody's humble they're aware of their strengths they just don't have a need to tout them to everybody else. Um, they keep them in balance. So they're aware. In fact, I think of them as being more confident, not less confident, um, but not that uh, ego driven to, um, to put it out there and prove something about themselves. Does that make sense? It does. It's a, a beautiful way to present what humility is. And as you and I've talked offline, there's tons of research that has been done on humility and this notion that humility means that I'm less than or I sense that I'm less than somebody else. And the reality is that it is, as I like to describe it, it's like the midpoint of a pendulum. So if we think about a pendulum moving left to right, there's the one side of the pendulum that is about being very ambitious and very confident and the human that I am. And if I really swing that pendulum over um, really far to that side, ego starts to show up in a pretty profound way, right? If I flip it on the other side, the lack of confidence at the highest level may show up. But when I allow that swinging to happen and it settles right in the middle, it's this place of knowing who I am and knowing what I'm not, knowing where I'm privileged and knowing what my beliefs and values are in myself and in relationship to those that I'm engaged with. I like that. Uh, that's a good image to create. So talk about how the cultural aspect ties in mm -hmm. with the word humility. So in Travelon and Murray Garcia's definition, it was really about the historical culture, the historical discourse um, that we bring with us um, from our own traditions, our own heritages. When I hold the word culture though, the way I'm proposing it in the reading uh, for readers as well as for those that are listening is that we all have our own internal culture. So I, as Angela, and you, Meredith, as yourself, we are organized in a particular way. We move through life with a particular narrative, a particular conversation that emerges or gets hidden um, that is our culture. So in this particular case, I'm really suggesting to the world that our that cultural humility first begins with ourselves. That we ourselves is a culture in and of itself, our internalizing, our internal uh, way of which we see the world and operate in the world is then either represented in an authentic way outside of who we are, or there is some masking that happens. And so really understanding um, what our, where we are balanced or imbalanced 
becomes an important part of the work. That is so interesting because I don't think many people listening would think of a culture of one. Mm -hmm. I know in my own case, I haven't thought about it as having an internal culture till you were mm -hmm. just mentioning that the idea of culture being more related to the people around me, you know, and how we interact together, what we create together. But when you talk about a culture of one, I think that's uh, important for raising this whole thing of awareness. And that's another term you mentioned in your article, cultural mm -hmm. awareness. Talk a little bit about the difference in what you mean between cultural awareness and cultural humility. Yeah, so coming back to the article specifically, in that article, um, it was really highlighting the fact that there are four different levels of cultural awareness, which we do speak to, with the highest level being I have an appreciation understanding of who I am in relationship to who somebody else is. That my culture, background, history, makeup is no better or worse than yours. In fact, it's using a notion of I'm okay and you're okay. Mm -hmm. And the more I can learn about you and the more you can learn about me only creates an expansion. It creates a space for imagination, for inspiration, for uh, innovation, quite frankly, to what you're really pointing to in that case. What I'm really saying in the article is that the way to move from level one to level four, the doorway is, cult is the practice of cultural humility, which begins with the deep reflective introspection into self. Really taking a deep look at all of the things I don't want to look at. Can I give you an example? Oh, that would be great. I was just th sitting here thinking it would be really cool to have a specific example of what does this look like so people can take it from the conceptual level to the application. Yeah. So um, my journey with cultural humility started when a colleague of mine, who is also uh, part of this article, Mich Michelle Vanderstaal, and I began to work um, on a proposal for a conference that was up in Victoria, British Columbia. And as a part of this body of work to talk about diversity and inclusion and equity and like, what is it? What does it really mean? Um, we, or I should say, I and she collectively began to look at, well, who are we in relationship to others? What is it that we pretend to know that we really don't know? or we know, but we pretend like it's not important. And so um, in my work, um, I began to realize that being white and being female, whether I held it as different or not, other people did. It came with a set of conversations about conversations that we weren't having. Now, for the listeners, that may sound like, come on, Angela, you're a master certified coach. You've been around the block for a while. How hard is this to, to know and to see? You're a white woman with privileges who grew up in a particular way. How in the world could you, of all people, be blind to the fact or the impact that that has on people around you? And what I would say to that is this. I also grew up on a small country farm where I was taught to believe that nobody was better than the next person. Like it is a deep rooted belief. So imagine in our work, as we're developing this program and this, um, this keynote speech, when the rub starts to happen between my belief that everybody is the same. Like that's the way I was brought up. That was the story, my narrative. And then realizing that, oh my gosh, you know what? When people look at me, we're not the same. So the rub really was that moment for me that tore everything down. And I had to start really looking deep into my backpack and wondering about what are those narratives that were passed down to me or those that I've collected along my way that have created privilege for me? And the question becomes, as Trevelon and Murray Garcia point to, so what now what? What are you going to do with it? Do you ignore it and shove it in the back of your backpack down in the corner where the dust collects and the gum wrappers are? Or do you take it out, look at it and smash it 
in order to reveal something much more precious about how I, in this case, went to engage with the larger world. And that was really the point behind the engagement that we spoke at, as well as behind the article itself, is to bring forward this idea of compassionate, uh, reflective inquiry that gets to the root of understanding systemically all the way down to a personal level who are we and how does who and how who we are does it actually impact the world around us so let's go a little bit deeper with that in terms of i love this compassionate reflection i think that's a great phrase because you want to in, encourage people to look within to see what I guess thinking about some of what you would want them to be doing is looking at what are some of the hidden biases that I might be carrying around that I haven't been aware of before. You're wanting people, I would think, to identify where are these areas where we've made assumptions or we're perceiving things a certain way about other individuals, but in reality, are you suggesting that we're making judgments and we're drawing conclusions and therefore um, taking actions, making decisions based on those assumptions rather than the reality of who's really in front of us. Yeah, so the, the, the first step um, is really to stand back and look at oneself. So back to the idea that I have an internal culture. So it is as much about what are to to borrow your word, to really look at what are my biases and how does it support the way in which I move in contrast to being so um, uh, in a conversation of what is the biases that limit me from getting to know somebody else. So I'm really asking people, encouraging people to first go deep and challenge their own internal um, uh, ways of which they see the world in order to then be able to say, now how do I want to see the world outside of me? It really is getting at the space between the silence that we often don't want to pay attention to that helps to, that does shape what, what it is our experiences are and challenge our own experiences of them. So when you think about, um, work you do with a client let's say you're mm -hmm. coaching an executive that's in a senior leadership position and you're helping them go through this process what is it that you see may have existed before they go through it in terms of their perception of others or just how the culture operates in that organization and then after they've raised their awareness and they've had some discoveries, insights with your assistance. What changes in the way the organization operates and the way people relate to each other? Now, the executive leaders who, um, inside of a larger organization, what happens is that they begin to break down their own defined brand or stereotypes that they have held themselves with. One of my favorite examples is that I had a, an executive who labeled himself in a derogatory way. And he took quite pride in that. So, mm. you know, I've always been this way. This is the way it's going to be. And people are just going to have to get over that. And when we highlight that through the lens of self-awareness, what we see is that he had a level of self-awareness that stopped at level two, which is, yes, I get there are other views that are available for me to look at. But the truth is my view is the best view. The way I see the world, the way I lead is the only way in which to lead. And in the work began to really help um, using um, conversations of perspective as an example. So one of the analogies you'll hear me or I often use is the one of the kaleidoscope. So as we look through the kaleidoscope itself, there's all these beautiful colors that exist. And as I move that kaleidoscope ever so gently, the shapes shift. Mm -hmm. But the question becomes what happens right before the shift takes place, right? Right before the next view is brought into focus. And that is that little essence, the conversation behind the conversation of where we begin to discover that the lack of confidence is what is producing, not, not overconfident, but a lack of confidence 
is actually what is producing the ability, the inability to be humble and gracious in light of other people. And so this particular executive leader made a declaration and said, you know, I have got to work on my own confidence in order to meet people where they are, because this is not the brand or the label that I choose to have. Now, mind you, this individual, I was not invited into the relationship because they were broken or they needed to be fixed or there was a problem at all. This was a discovery based on a larger uh, commitment that the organization had to every executive, CEO, and president inside the company. So there is this wonderful aspect of um, we are nothing more than a reflection of the leadership that we are. Like cultural humility, it gives us a place to learn the how-to behind um, getting deeper and more saturated in the development of our own awareness, be it cultural awareness, which for me is the whole person, or if it's about awareness from a place of just cognitive, intellectual awareness, as an example. So with this particular executive, as he raised his awareness, what changed in the way that he interacted with other people and what new thinking or processing did he go through in those kinds of situations? Mm -hmm. There was a slowing down that happened, um, almost naturally, quite frankly. So with the practice of compassionate reflection and reflective inquiry, there's a natural movement towards slowing down, breathing into the moment, right? The inhale and the exhale. And although those were things that practices that we put in place initially, over time, it became a part of just his natural habit. So even leaving his doorway, so um, he would look at his threshold and say, who do I need to be in order to be my best self when I walk through my door? Oh, I like that. That's right? great. And who do I want to be? How do I want to be perceived? What are the questions and the curiosities that I have about the people who sit around the room? You know, Meredith, when we think about the time that we're in right now, what people are really looking for is this deeper level of connection and a sense of belonging and a, a feeling of harmony, right, with other people around the world and with colleagues that we're not even getting to see in this moment. Right. And my claim is that the practice of cultural humility, raising our level of awareness, produces that level of curiosity, deeper connection, humbleness, in order to learn more and to be able to innovate. Well, I just love that approach, and I love the questions he started asking himself, because what it um, emphasizes for me, and it's probably where I am in my own growth, you know, we resonate with certain points that people make based on yeah. where we are ourselves, but this idea of who do I need to be suggests that I have the ability to change in a given and to choose. Right, yeah. exactly. And to choose. So that we don't feel like we're stuck with being a particular way, like he did when you started initially working with him. Mm -hmm. He defined himself in a specific way of being that he saw as permanent or concrete even. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like you helped him open up to the idea that he can be whoever he chooses to be as he perceives what's needed in a given moment. Right. And it really, you know, his ultimate goal, which I didn't speak to, was to produce a collaborative environment that was inclusive. So the real call to action, the real body of work, sort of the story behind the story was one of, I want to be known for, I want to take a stand for inclusivity, where everybody's voice can be heard. And there's a level of, of safety that's present that people feel as if they can say what needs to be said. So behind in the background for him, his deeper care was about maximizing the contributions of everybody on the team. And what he was struggling with was the how-to part of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting underneath of that and having him make that different declaration, that different choice on a day-to-day -day basis allowed him to make the decision who am I, who do I need to be to hear all voices that sit around this table, even if it is 
um, a direct conflict to a belief that I have. And now let me go back and hang out with Angela and figure out why is that belief in, in that space? What does that really mean to me? How does that open? How does that close my ability to be more inclusive, to create dip, uh, deeper connection and belonging with those that I am in service with? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that just causes me to think about how we all have these um, beliefs about other people, uh, whether it be, you know, gender, age, ethnicity, it doesn't matter in a way. We carry around these thoughts. And ever since our earlier conversations, I've caught myself at times when I see someone else and I think about how am I internally reacting to them no matter what I look like on the outside but what thoughts are going through my head so I become more aware of what um, just what's going on and I think that that sounds like a, a first aspect of working with someone is helping them to like you say slow down and notice mm-hmm. what it is without judgment but just notice and that's why I like your compassionate reflection because it's we're not wanting to jump into judging ourselves in a similar way as we may have judged someone else because of what we've perceived about them. And so I'm wondering with some of these um, clients that I would, I guess I would say that maybe have been more resistant to that, but then they eventually, like this person, uh, come around to at least being willing to look and 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 uh, that kind of thing. What is it that you're finding keeps people in that resistance mode? What is it they're afraid of, or what is it that holds them back? It's always about someone else and not about them. It's their need to be right versus being curious about what are all the other possibilities that are availed. So you use the word fear, right? And in um, business, in our corporate world, and even in our nonprofit sector, for that matter, we can't avoid the conversation of power. We can't avoid the conversation of politics, right? It is a systemic conversation that floods all of us in the background, or maybe some of us in the foreground, that is an ultimate driver for um, executive leaders and you and I alike to constantly struggle with what is our position in relationship to someone else? And how do we, as Murray Garcia and Trevelon speak to, right? The second principle that they offer is, now that you know, how do we work to uh, create a balance to offset the power imbalances that exist in life? We can do that certainly as the principle three suggests at an institutional level. And I would say that this particular executive along with the entire body of leadership is looking to institutionalize a different way of engaging to, to bring voice, to have safety in a way that is absolutely uniquely and unique and different. But it does start with the question of once I have a sense for how I might be, how I might be perceived by somebody else, because that is as important as how I want to be perceived or how I think I should be perceived to break down those things and say, now what is my responsibility to break the power imbalance that exists? Mm -hmm. And for most of the executives, it's a power, it's a power dialogue, right? It's a power triangle for yeah. them to have to constantly deal with. That makes perfect sense. So for these folks, how do you coach them to bring the same sense of awareness, of compassionate reflection to all the other people in the organization? Because you're not individually coaching those folks. So how do you make it more of a standard way of being Mm -hmm. within a whole company or a whole or entire organization? I appreciate you asking that question. It's a passion spot for me too. Um, So in the aspects of culture, if we just break it down to a team level, so we'll kind of think, uh, we'll look at it small and then we can um, globalize it out. But in essence, it is about taking the pause every 15 or 20 minutes in a conversation and asking the question, 
How are we doing right now? Is everyone's voice in the room being heard? What is not being said that if it were said would be additive to this conversation? Here's what I'm noticing. Here's what I'm not noticing before moving on to the next topic. Several oh, of the organizations. Those are brilliant questions. Many of the organizations I've been working with over the last three or four years have put those practices in play. And what sounds like, come on, Angela, it's an hour conversation. You've now dwindled to 20 or 40 minutes. And what you quickly realize is you can ask those questions and be and move on in a way that's more holistic, more connected in two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. So as practice happens, people are less likely to hold back. There's a level of safety and confidence and commitment to bringing forward the undiscussables that show up in the conversation that, you know, we hold back on, that we leave in our backpacks at the bottom, down in the corner, because we don't think we're good enough or it's not going to want to be heard where the chewing gum wrappers live, right? So we're yanking all of that out and throwing it on the table so there are no elephants in the room, so to speak. We get the best of everybody that way. So it sounds to me like those questions could work whether you're having a meeting with two or more people or in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yes, that's right. And so they're incorporating it in all of the aspects throughout the organization, whether it is a group meeting of 50 people, 100 people, or five people in a room. It's become the practice that many of the clients are engaging with on a regular basis to bring the practice of inclusion, right? What we're all striving for, inclusion into the workplace and outside of the workplace in our civic organization so that we can deepen and broaden our understanding and create more of an equality in our work together. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so important. This, the, those questions really do have that effect of including other people uh, or making you aware of who has not been included because sometimes we unconsciously call on certain people more than others or some speak up more than others and we forget who we haven't heard from. And mm -hmm. sometimes they've given up trying because of being um, overpowered by someone else who's more vocal or more forceful and uh, we lose out on so much from the folks that tend to be quieter and not demand to be heard. So to be invited and be given a, the safety of doing that, to me, which is just very powerful. And I would think that what happens is people start observing that in their leader and then feel comfortable doing it with each other. Do you find that it transfers? It does. It has a beautiful trickle-down effect, right? As um, we give them a bit of um, background in terms of what it is that we're building, so the why, we give them some what, and then the how is what they're actually observing and beginning to role model and practice, right? So the reflective type questions, being very purposeful and intentional about in integrating them in even when we feel like the meeting has to hurry up and get done because it's a brand new practice of being in those conversations. And, you know, again, I keep coming back to the self here. Um, the reality is, is that if there is somebody who's sitting quietly in the room, maybe it's not about them at all. Maybe it's about a conversation that they need to have with you offline about the way there's some impression or interpretation that, they're ha that they have of you because of, prior engagement or observations that they've made, or maybe they've got a, a conversation about where you originate from. And so it never is going to get away from always wondering if somebody is sitting quietly or a team of people sitting quietly, making sure that we're always checking, what is it about me that I'm not being able to create a listening that creates conversation flow back and forth? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That, that's really profound. Well, you mentioned these um, principles and you mentioned, you know, referred to principle two and three. Tell us what those principles are and how do they manifest themselves in the real world? So the first principle that they speak to is just, it's a lifelong practice. Much like uh, we think about just our own growth and development, 
as you do in your work and in your most recent book that you've just put out into the world, right? It is lifelong. It is a development that, uh, process that has no end. And so the first principle that they really tout is one of you have to have a commitment to lifelong learning about who you are and about the world that's around you. And it's more than, Meredith, than just saying, well, I've been to Chile, or I've been to Europe, or I've been to, um, uh, you know, one of the major parks in the United States, Yellowstone. It's more than that. It's about being really curious and wondering about who are they and what can I learn and how does that land with me and how does that land with you? So what is the relationship in that lifelong learning aspect? Which is really for me where the cultural humility part comes in, where we have to let go of who we think we are and really get to know who we are in relationship with another. So that constant growth and metamorphosis transformation. Before you go to the next principle, one thought I'm having is it, it, it sounds like number one as part of being this lifelong learner is being curious about the unique value of each person that you encounter, recognizing there's something innately valuable about them just because they are. And I think that that really opens us up to learning from others or about others as we can let go of, well, they don't have anything worthwhile to say, or, you know, they've been a pain in the past, they've been a complainer, it, it, that we label them with prior experiences if they're somebody that we've dealt with before. If it's a stranger, there may be something very simple about their appearance or a mannerism or anything that causes us to shut down. And what number one sounds like it's all about is just that willingness to be curious about everyone and kind of search for their unique value. You know, not, I don't want to say make it a game, but make it something that each person is their own unique experience for you. And looking for what is the the wonderful experience I'm going to get to have with this person. Yes, and knowing and realizing that you too are that same unique experience for other people. Mm, good point. Mm -hmm. mm. So number two. Yeah. So number two is about once we recognize that I'm unique gift and you're a unique gift, and the world is filled with these unique gifts, and we're all in this journey of curiosity together, is then to beg the question, either individually and certainly ideally collectively, so how are we going to course correct the humanness and the history that we all come to 2020 with? Because we all come with it. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to shift the power imbalances that exist? And that can be as sim simple as um, uh, no longer holding out, holding the notion that a male should always open the car door for a female. Now, you and I both know that's a beautiful thing to have happen. And I am fortunate that it happens to me a lot. Yet it is, a, it's those basic fundamentals of things that we've become accustomed to that may or may not serve, right? So no harm, no foul on my example that I provided. But imagine for a moment, if we're inside of an organization, and the, the notion of power looks like I'm a manager and you're a supervisor. If I hold you as less than because your title is different than mine, I am not elevating, I'm not rebalancing the power and balance. I can recognize I may come with more experience, I may have been around longer, I may have a bigger scope and span of control. But I can come to you in conversation as a place of being equal, knowing that you have a certain, a certain set of views in which you see the world, a certain set of gifts that without them, I cannot be the best manager that I could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So just in that way, we can rebalance the power that is perceived to be present, that immediately makes me less than or more than you in the world. Now, again, we can scope that up, right? We can take that out into our societal aspects to our globe as it relates to what part of the world did you grow up in in the United States or across the, you know, the, the lake, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So 
I would say that all of that is fair game as we look up and out beyond, but in its simplistic way, it is about holding each person as a human and rebalancing it, regardless of the position that we hold inside of the company. Everybody has something of value to offer. That's great. And so what's number three? And the very last one is about institutionalizing. So taking cultural humility and blowing it up. So making it programmatic, right, throughout the organization, much like what we talked about earlier. So how do we create it in the form of a system? How do we produce enough self-awareness and cultural awareness that it penetrates all 3,000 employees or 50,000 employees? And <laughs> exactly, or a hundred employees, but making an institutional commitment that being humble and showing one another that we can be of value no matter what position, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our gender, no matter how we label ourselves, that we each and every one of us have something different and unique to offer that creates a space of new innovation in order for us globally, quite frankly, to even be a better place than we've ever been before. Wonderful. Well, Angela, I know we could go on for another hour, <laughs> uh, but we're really at the end of our time together. Thank you for all of these wonderful insights that you've provided about this concept of cultural humility. And I'd like to invite the listeners to take time to do that compassionate reflection that you talked about to sort of identify what, what, what's been in their backpack. What are they carrying <laughs> around that may not be serving them very well? And you've provided just a wealth of information. I know some folks are going to want to be able to connect with you. How can they um, connect with you and learn more about your services? Yeah, so um, it's Angela at ignitingsuccess.com. And it's I-G-N-I-T-I-N-G-S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S. You can go and you can email me directly. You can go to my website, which is also ignitingsuccess.com. I encourage you to also reach out to my partner in crime who wrote this article with me. I mentioned her earlier. Her name is Michelle Vander Stowe. She, is, she can be found at a, on her website at onpoint, O-N-P-O-I-N-T-E.com. She is fantastic. She is as rich and mindful about this work as I am. And we hope to launch here in the next uh, several months a program and ultimately a book um, that we're referring to commonly now as Expanding Your Flock. Expanding so that is really oh. Expanding Your Flock. That really is getting at the how-to in enriching one's life using the fundamental premises that we've talked about around cultural humility and deepening and expanding our cultural awareness. Well, that's great. Well, we'll be putting links uh, to your site um, and your social media profiles on the show Thanks. notes page for people to be able to look for you there. Angela, thank you so much for your you, contribution to my audience today and also for the wonderful work you've been doing and are still doing with uh, clients, I guess, all over the world. Hmm. Yes, it is all over the world. I had the privilege today to talk to somebody over in Singapore and found out that they were doing fine and, um, you know, they're, they're getting through what they need to in that part of, a part of the world. So it gives me hope that we too aren't going to be too far behind. Oh, I agree. Well, thank you again for being with me. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.